Our reading this morning is from the film. I did clean my teeth this morning. <laughs> um, our reading this morning is from Philippians. Uh, and Paul, in writing to the church at Philippi, said, and uh, verse one of uh, chapter one, verse twenty-seven. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then. Whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And then in chapter 2, verses 12 to 16. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on that day of Christ, that I did not run in there, or labour in vain. May the Lord add to our interpretation of his reading. Thanks very much, Cliff. We're looking today at the fact that uh, how we behave, and I'm going to head in two directions, how we behave as individuals and also how we behave as a church. Now, we need to understand that the Philippian church at this time was perhaps going through a time of crisis. We've already picked up the fact that there's probably a little bit of uh, rumbling and uh, division going on. And also, there's a time of persecution. I think Nero was just about to come into power and things are, there are dark clouds on the horizon as far as the church is concerned. And in this time of persecution, in this time of anxiety, Paul says this, only live your life in a manner of the gospel of Christ. Only live your life in a matter of the gospel of Christ. Now, when things are going bad for a church, what happens? Uh, do they need to hear this? Yes, they do, because what happens, is the same with a lot of the organisations we're part of, when things are going bad, when sort of there's no future, relationships begin to deteriorate. And Paul's got a lot to say about that. Church finances go downhill. The sense of optimism starts to decrease and the church heads towards a part where it's in trouble. Now, you often hear people say persecution's good for the church. But as we look around the world, I think the ecclesiologists would say that's not the case. When a church is under persecution, all types of things happen. Certainly attendance drops, numbers drop, and people bow out. And you look at the uh, communism, uh, you look at the churches in China, and uh, even though they're surviving, they're not doing all that well. You look at the churches in Russia, and uh, during the time of persecution and repression, the church actually decreased. Try and establish a church in parts of the Middle East, and you will really be really working hard as you overcome the issues of being a church in a Muslim country. How do we behave? And I guess as we look at our society, our things are becoming easier for the church. I often hear people say we're being uh, under persecution. I think that's a load of rubbish when you look around the world and see what's happening there. But things aren't getting easier for us as a church. And I'll be going through that in a little while. And what Paul says to us, don't forget who you are. 
And the very opening sentence, he talks about the saints of God with the bishops and deacons. Now, you think about your week and think of the things that you've done, and some of you would say, mm, I'm not too sure if it's been that saintly. Uh, Karen on the golf course, when she missed a shot, <laughs> she told God all about it, but it wasn't very saintly, I can tell you that. <laughs> now, we look around the, look around the Australian church, and uh, we, I'd like talking about George Pell. George Pell, who I thought was treated badly by the courts in his uh, imprisonment time, he wasn't a guy who came across as saintly. He didn't come across as a guy who was compassionate. He was, but he didn't express it well. Israel Fallou, uh, the rugby player, and I think he played a bit of AFL for a while, he was a guy who wasn't seen as saintly. All the homosexuals are going to hell. Brian Houston, uh, with his, uh, if you like, fall for grace, people would say, oh, I'm not too sure that he's saintly. When you look at the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and the way they're behaving, they would say not too saintly. When you look at the evangelicals in the United States as they carry their guns into church, you would say not very saintly. Actually, I just heard, read an email this morning. I've got a lot of friends in the States at the moment on a study tour and uh, they were talking about a church they went to in Arizona where they have mass baptisms, where they say, you know, come to the front and you'll be baptised. And uh, they have all the gear ready for them to be baptised. And the most frequent question, the people helping them get ready for baptism, is by the people being about to be baptised, would you mind holding my gun for me? <laughs> How about that? <laughs> the church is imperfect. And I've said this before. The church is imperfect because we're part of it. And Paul is reminding us that we are meant to be different. We are meant to be saints, people who are set apart. Now you'd say, well, perhaps if we go back to the first century, we go back to the early church, things were much better then. And I'm not too sure about that. Now, the Corinthian church fought about anything. Galatian church used to fight about circumcision. The book of Acts used to fight amongst families and uh, Jews and Christians. And you see that the church in the first century was not always saintly. And uh, as I've indicated earlier on, e almost every letter that Paul writes, he says, it's important that you be saintly with the way that you ha help each other. Now, what is it to be a saint? It is to be a person who is set apart, the person who is different, the person who is meant to be the light of the world. And again, I reflect on how things used to be when I was growing up in the church. Uh, no dancing. And uh, I know the girls and the boys used to go off on a Saturday night and dance. So no smoking. Make sure you go around the corner and not be seen. Even the picture theatre was regarded as uh, not being very saintly. And I was thinking about this and I remember in the 1960s seeing the film Peyton Place. Do you remember that film? It was the first pornographic film. I wondered if I should be there. You know. And the only pornographic part was a sight of a woman without her clothes on around about 400 metres away. And even, do you remember the film Psycho by Hitchcock? People groaned and moaned about that because it showed for the very first time in a film a toilet. And uh, it was seen as bad. But we didn't, weren't supposed to go to the pictures. We weren't supposed to organise a milkshake on Sundays. I passed up a grand final uh, as a football umpire when I was a young adult, young teacher, because it was going to be on a Sunday. And we saw being set apart was observing a lot of rules and regulations. But it's more than that. And being set apart sees we, means we see each other differently and we see the world differently. We look at war and we see that as not according to the will of God. We see global concerns and we see the issues in Africa at the moment, for example, and we say that is not according to the will of God. We see injustice, we see with our own Aboriginal people, and we say that's not according to the will of God. Being saintly is not just being like the three wise monkeys, do no evil, see no evil, hear no evil, and that's very, very reactive if you like. It's also being proactive and trying to make a difference for the world. We're here as transformers. We're not meant to be reactions. 
And I've often used the uh, illustration in this series on Philippians, the little word en, E-N, and it's a dative in, in Greek which says, in the power of Christ. And if we're on the march to becoming more saintly, more people who are set apart for the kingdom of God, it means that we are in Christ. It's in the power of Christ. Saints, well, as I think of myself and I think of you, it doesn't describe the actuality. It describes the potential. And Paul is calling us all on the path to sainthood. And he also asks us to stand firm. I know, he says to them, you are standing firm in the one spirit of God. In other words, maintain yourselves. I remember a windy day at Wollongong at, uh, in August and the wind did blow and I think I've told you about a building was destroyed. And uh, I had a bit of an illness, I'd lost a lot of weight and I went out to mow the lawns. And in that wind I was actually blown over. Hanging onto the lawnmower and I was blowing over. And so I got Marge to finish off the lawns for me. <laughs> when you think of that, you think of the, you know, to think of the church as a sailing ship and the wind is blowing. And sometimes, as I said, we're tacking into the wind. We're, we're heading into a difficult area. And sometimes we allow ourselves to be blown around. Some of you with a sense of history of the church would know that the wind's blowing sometimes. Oh, I remember the ecumenical movement and the, the debates that used to be about that. And I was on the other side of it. I was in the Evangelical Fellowship and I remember the debates about that. I remember the Toronto Blessing where people were called out to the front and they burst out laughing and carrying on, falling over. Jehovah, Jehovah, I'm going to fall over. Uh, and we remember that as a phase that went, came and went. There was the serendipity phase where you pick up the Bible and whatever it said to you must be right. It didn't matter about the context or the uh, literary setting or anything like that. It's what it said to you. We went through the emerging church movement where people met in small homes rather than in the church and the microchurch is continuing on about that. I've been involved in the debates about the, whether the church is meant to be small or beautiful or mega is mighty. And we think about those fads that have come and go and we've been blown around by them. And what Paul says to us, stand firm. Know who you are. We know where you are going. And a church and an individual that doesn't have a sense of direction will be blown around all over the place. Now, as I said before, the culture in the church, uh, the culture in the Australian society has changed. And we are now a minority. And we'll be surrounded by a lot of voices saying, come this way, come that way, retreat or whatever else. And Paul says, stand firm. And if you don't have a sense of direction in your life, if the church doesn't have a sense of direction, we will hear every voice and we'll blow, allow ourselves to be blown all over the place. Hebrews reminds us that we need to be looking under Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And whatever our goals are, whatever our values are, Christ stands at the centre of it all. And these voices, these voices sometimes are opposed to who we are and what we're about. And Paul, in the light of this opposition, he says, don't regress back to Judaism. We'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. And I, I reflected on my own ministry. And um, I reflected on the fact that my, people would say about my ministry that I've always been goal orientated. I've always been dissatisfied with the status quo. I've always sort of wanted the church to move in a certain direction. And uh, I think of when we went to Blackburn, it was like jumping on a moving bus. When we went to Wollongong, it was like jumping on a moving bus. In our retirement, when we established Bayview, it was a matter of building the bus and getting the bus moving. But always sort of dissatisfied with the way that things are. And I remember our early days at Bayview. And uh, it was a new church. We brought together two old churches that had decided to close down. And what the, uh, the older churches wanted to do was to bring into the new church their agendas. And I, I had to say, well, you think of your agendas and you think of where it took you and it didn't take you very far. 
And there are some who said we must focus on pastoral needs and that must be foremost. Others said we need to be doing more about social issues. Others said let's concentrate on devotional life and if our hearts are right, the church will grow. Let's preserve our democratic traditions. All things that are valid, but most of all, we need to have the priority of establishing ourselves as a church. And it reminds me of a time I was called back to Blackburn after some years. I was celebrating their centenary and uh, they reminded me as we went back through history and people had their story. <laughs> One story they reminded me of is uh, uh, the fact that there was a lady in the outer office who I didn't want to see and when the Beryl Graham, the church secretary, opened up the door, I wasn't in the office and the windows were flapping in the breeze and I jumped out the window and disappeared. The trouble is in jumping out the window, I jumped into a blackberry bush and uh, made myself a very bloody mess. Now, uh, when, you, when you see that, uh, when you see well, what people said to me most of all, which is most satisfying, was not stories like that, but this church, they said, helped me to discover Jesus. And that said to me something about being goal-orientated. The most important thing that a church can do is lead people to Christ. Nothing more important. Other things follow that. And I was really enheartened to hear that said of Marge and myself. I know of a minister who died last, last year, I think it was, a minister called Kevin Harvey. Alan, you know Kevin? Yeah. And Kevin fixed up his funeral before he died and he actually did a video. And uh, the pro purpose of the video was that he wasn't going to let his family uh, give the eulogy, he was going to give his own. And uh, I thought, that's a good idea, I'm going to do that myself. Now, <laughs> what he said was, as I look at life, the most important thing I did in ministry, and he became a counsellor in the end, was introduce people to Jesus Christ. Stand firm, says Paul. Stand firm on what? Have a God-centred purpose. And that starts to impact the way you use your time, starts to impact your relationships, starts to impact your behaviour. Stand firm in the gospel. And then Paul goes on, and we've covered this ground before, he wants us to see the positives. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, he says, so that you may become blameless and pure. And grumblers, I was talking about grumblers last week, Grumblers sometimes need a little bit of a attention to themselves because often they're expressing a problem they've got with themselves that they project on others. And here's a church going through adversity and Paul's saying to them, don't become a grumbler because things aren't going well. And as we go through change, and every church is going through change, whether they like it or not, whether they plan it or not, they're all going through some type of change, we need to think as to whether we're a grumbler or not. And I thought to myself, what am I like? And I guess one of the things I have to say about myself is, I remember me talking about the fact that there are early adopters, there are middle adopters, and there are people who never change, who would never want to see change. I put myself in the middle. I see myself as a middle adopter. In my youth, I played the organ, and uh, I remember going to Berwick Church once and talking to the minister there and they were telling me about this grand new grand piano they put and I said, where's the organ? Out in the shed, they said. And I said, you can't do that. I couldn't cope with that change in music. And when guitars started to come and drums come, to, I sort of was a middle adopter. I had to adjust to that. And Marge will tell you, I'm a bit of a hoarder. We've got two big sheds in our home and some of, one of them is full of junk. By the way, does anybody want an oil filter from 1980 Sigma? <laughs> <laughs> and now, in the midst of this, Paul says, stand firm on the things that matter. Put Christ at the core and there will be changes. But what you need to do to, see, to cope with that change is not to be a grumbler. But, here I want to take a bit of a diversion. I see myself as a person who struggled with change. As a young person, I sat there with the people of Middle Park and the ladies with their felt hats, and we sang Marching to Zion. We sang, Why Do You Wait, Dear Brother? They're waiting for people to come out the front. 
And then we became a little bit more sophisticated. These are music changes. And we sang Be Thou Vision and uh, other sort of more sophisticated hymns. Then Jazz in the Church, At the Name of Jesus. And then the choruses started to come in and some of them were very, very subjective. He touched me, oh, he touched me. And then the unsingable songs came from Hillsong. And I had to adjust and sometimes I found myself struggling with change, not because I was opposed to change, but because of my own abilities to cope with playing with them. And we need to sometimes think as we're confronted with change, whether the church and ourselves will find ourselves growing outside our own abilities. And we need to work out whether we're a grumble person for that as well. Now, when we start thinking about that, uh, you start thinking about the fact that the church does need leadership. And when you look at the church, and you look at churches that are growing, churches that are healthy, always there has been a, a wise element of leadership. And uh, Alan had the same experience as I had with the Home Mission Department, travelling all around Victoria and Tassie and sometimes Australia as well. And you found churches would go as well as the leadership would let it go. And sometimes uh, you need to think about whether democracy is the, the choice. And when you look at the Bible, you'll discover the Bible says a lot about leadership, but doesn't say much about democracy. And I think there needs to be a balance for that as well. Now, we look at leadership and we say, well, Brian Houston was a very, very good leader. What went wrong? And you become very nervous about that. The thing about people like Brian is that they didn't have a system of accountability. And that is the important factor that needs to be there. Do all things without moaning, even though we might have to change. But there are some things that are worth moaning about. And I want to talk about that for a minute. I, I, uh, I saw that uh, the casino was uh, fined, what, $2.5 million? I didn't cry about that one little bit. And I thought to myself, we need to think about the gambling industry and what it's doing to people. We need to think about the housing of our Indigenous people. We need to think about people of uh, 40 or 50 years younger, perhaps our own children, who are struggling to buy a house and settle in it. Let me tell you a story. A couple of years ago, Marge and I went up to Mildura Church and uh, we spoke there and then we were trying to raise money for the debt and project. The Dayton Church of Christ is about over the border, about four, eight k away from Mildura. And an old lady there, Vi Waters, who's now gone, was rewarded a, an award by the government for the work that she did amongst the Aborigine people. She was a Church of Christ person. And so we looked at this, we wanted to raise money for a drop-in centre. And we heard a lot about the Aborigine question in Dayton. We heard that Vi virtually gave her life for that and it didn't make a great deal of difference. We heard about the tribal warfare that occurs in this small village in which, uh, where sometimes there are 20 or 30 people living in the one house. We heard about the, uh, the fact that children were growing up uh, affected by the drinking patterns of their parents and the alcohol syndrome was affecting the way that they work. We heard about children who couldn't stay at school. We heard about strong divisions, tribal warfare. And when you saw that, and we also heard one story which made us very sad. It was one girl who was brilliant at school, and uh, an Aboriginal girl, and was set to go to Melbourne Uni to do law. And her father said to her, we don't want you to go over to the other side and become a white person. And you hear that and you hear to yourself, oh, I'm not sure the voice is going to make that much difference. While, while I'm all in favour of people having a say, and I hope that continues, uh, you look at this situation and you think to yourself, how does the voice going to solve the problems of that Dayton area? Another thing that I've become a bit grum certainly become grumbly about the situation about our Aborigines, I also become grumbly about gender transition. <laughs> and here I need to understand that here I am in the 21st century reflecting the values of the 20th century. I'm very upset about the fact that in Uganda, anybody who <laughs> is found in a homosexual activity or undergoing gender transition can face capital punishment. 
That annoys me. And then I also heard a story from Northwood High School. I don't know if you've heard this story. The year seven children were sent a letter out by the person who was responsible for their wellness, the wellness officer. And the wellness officer was a person who replaced the chaplain in the school. And the wellness officer said this in her email, which I heard uh, was read over the news recently. If you're worried about what pronoun you're using, or if you want to go by another name, or if you're worried about your future in your t particular gender at the moment, you can come and see us and your parents will know nothing about it. Now, I understand that some children have gender issues. I understand that some of them go through transitions. But here is a communication to year seven children who don't really understand where they're at, what they're at, being encouraged to think an alternative. And that upset me a bit. I don't know if it upsets you, but it upset me a little bit as well. So we're in a world that's different. And what Paul is saying to us, be Christian citizens regardless. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. And he's talking to a group of people, <laughs> pardon me, who live in a Roman colony. And the Roman colony is very conscious of the fact of their citizenship. And Paul is saying, above that, you are citizens of the kingdom of God. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. As a child growing up, we used to gather on a Monday morning, like many of you did, and we used to say, I love God, I love, serve the king, and uh, cheekily obey my parents and teachers of the law and all that. Remember that pledge we used to have? And there's a group of kids who were not involved in that. And they were pulled out by the teachers and sent to one side of the school assembly. And they were children who were the children of Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, even though they went to extreme, at least they understood that we are meant to be kingdom, citizens of the kingdom of God before we are citizens of Australia. And when you see that, you see that they were prepared to pay a price. And Paul says, being a citizen, I want you to live it out in a practical way. I want you to live out the, as we call the harvest of righteousness. Or I want you to work out your salvation. And remember last week we were looking at that text which talked about whatever things are true, honour and justice and pure and all that type of thing, do these things, think about these things. The verb think is a verb logisse. And it says think and do. Think beauty, think honour, think justice, think pure. Be Christian citizens, live your life as a matter of the gospel. Live out your faith. How do we do that? Throughout this letter we've discovered that Paul wants us to be people who are positive and to be very much aware of the things that we need to be thanking God for. He's reminding us time and time again that we need to be in Christ, in the power of Christ. We need to be standing firm in the spirit. We need to see the small issues that have impact our lives, but we also need to have a global view of what is to be to come. There's a lifetime quest that we're all involved in, and that is to close the gap between what we are and what we are meant to be. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel. That's why I like communion. Communion is a time of reflection. And in our communion time this morning, as we come out and we take the bread and we go back to our seats in the cup and we drink within our own time, in that communion time, it's a time when we measure up and we ask God to say to us, what other thing can I do to make sure that I'm living my life in a manner worthy of the gospel? It is a time of reflection. It is a time when, of confession when we acknowledge that we haven't always done it. At the end of communion, we're going to quietly sing that uh, beautiful song about Christ being our vision. And uh, I want you to understand that communion is a beautiful, sacred time when we see ourselves in the sight of God. Let's think, give thanks. Dear God, our Father, help us to be mindful of your love. Help us to be mindful of your presence. And as we take the bread and cup, help us to be mindful of who we are 
and what you mean us to be. Help us to grow in Christ that we might be reflecting his love and compassion. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Come, share in the cup and share in the bread.